Right. Well, first of all, thanks uh, to York and to Carol for inviting me. It's very kind, and to the entire organizing committee because they've made everything completely uh, simple and, and comfortable for me. So I'm going to jump in. I have a lot to say. Um, notice that uh, I'm, I'm following the FAIR principles, so I have a license and I have a URL, and uh, you are welcome to share this and reuse it as much as you like. There's a lot of words in these slides, and that's so that you don't have to remember what I said. I invite you to give the slide deck yourself whenever you wish. Okay, let's talk about where it began, the birth of FAIR, and some of my own commentary about, uh, about what I think were the good things and the bad things of the principles. So it starts back at this meeting that was hosted by Baron Mons in 2014 called the Jointly Designing a Data Fairport Meeting. And at that meeting, briefly, we uh, set forth about 30 core requirements uh, and Baron subsequently joined those into categories of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And note that at that meeting, FAIR was not an acronym. It became an acronym because of this categorization that Baron did after it. Uh, we put the beta edition of now 15 principles up on the Force 11 website for community feedback, but in parallel with that, at the Nagasaki Biohackathon, uh, Michel de Montier and I and a few other contributors got together and we polished the principles to make sure that they were really separate issues in each of the principles. And of course, then we get the paper. Uh, just a few weeks from now, it's going to be the 10-year anniversary of the original meeting, and we're going to meet again in Lorenz to discuss where do we go from here. <clears throat> now, personal commentary. Regrets, I've had a few. But then again, too few to mention. Okay, I'm going to apologize for some things. First of all, fair data. Data <laughs> is misinterpreted, uh, and it causes a lot of heartbreak. Uh, and I wish we had not used that word. I wish we had found another word like fair digital objects, which is great, and fair research objects, much less confusion than the word data. So, so I have a little bit of depression about that. <clears throat> Principle F2, data described with rich metadata defined by R1. Oh, that's awful, right? So metadata in F is for discovery. Metadata in R is for reuse, different kinds of metadata, and it should not be referring uh, from one section of the principles to the other. Regret. This is interesting, and I'm going to come back to this late in the slide. This is an unusual principle. Uh, metadata explicitly include the identifier of the data it describes. This is actually not necessary anymore, I think, based on a recommendation from the EOS task force I'll talk about later. This one is confusing. Metadata richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. What does plurality mean? Well, that word came from Michel de Montier uh, at the Biohackathon, and he fought, wanted to find a word that meant more than enough. But in fact, this is a call to action, right? This is a principle that puts responsibility on you to do something, right? If it's not enough, you have to make it more than enough, right? We'll talk about what that looks like in a moment. And this one is my last regret. Using the word license has tripped up someone, so many people because license actually has jurisdictional meanings. In some jurisdictions, it's not clear that data can be licensed at all. Um, I wish we had chosen something like data access usage policy or something less, less than a license. Creative works clearly can be licensed, not clear if data can, at least jurisdictionally. So those are my regrets about the principles. And I'm going to revisit each of those again later on. Vignette number two. What is my motivation for giving the presentation that I'm giving today? Well, it comes from uh, Dr. Lasilla, who is co-author of the RDF specification, co-author of the original The Semantic Web paper together with Tim Berners-Lee and, and James Handler. And last year, at the Semantic Web Applications and Tools for Life Sciences, meeting, uh, he gave a keynote called Reimagining the Semantic Web, What Worked and What Did Not. And I'm taking screenshots from his presentation. So the old web was for humans and so on. I'm going to focus on this line here. And the new web, the Semantic Web Vision, was focused on agents. And that made my heart explode because, as Carol will attest, my entire 
informatics career has been focused on agents. I love agents. And then he said, the new semantic web, agents have been replaced by cloud services. Oh, <laughs> or I killed the agents. Right? And I was heartbroken. And I don't believe it. Right? And so when I wrote this paragraph in the original principles paper, this necessitates machines to be capable of autonomously and appropriately acting when faced with a wide range of types, formats, access mechanisms that will be encountered during their self-guided exploration of the global data ecosystem. Clearly, I was referring to agents. So when I authored the FAIR paper, <laughs> I was authoring it for agents, and they've just been killed by Aura. <laughs> so, so can agents be saved? So the remainder of this talk, I'm going to tell you some fairy tales, and I'm going to bring it back to agents. Uh, TLDR, I think I can save the agents for many important use cases, maybe not all, uh, and FAIR plays a large role in, in accomplishing that. All right, vignette number three. I'm going to talk to you about the European Joint Program on Rare Diseases, EJPRD, which is a large-scale verification initiative. How large? 1,800 participants in 35 countries, spanning 91 institutions. 85% uh, of the European rare disease research community is directly or indirectly involved. What's my job? Make it fair. <laughs> Not just me, of course, but me and, and we call it pillar two, which is the technical pillar. So the challenge is we need to make these participants' data resources work together. Now, generally speaking, this is the rare disease community. They all, they all have more or less the same data, different starting formats, but but they are forbidden from sharing and often forbidden from moving their data, right? This is a problem that begs for an agent-based solution, right? We can't kill the agents yet, right? So this is our starting point, and we're really lucky because the European uh, Commission has been very focused on rare diseases for quite a long time in the past, and they've come up with a set of common data elements for uh, rare disease registration. And so I'm showing you a few of them here. I think there's 18 or 20 different data types, but you'll see that they have date of birth, and they have sex, and they have patient status, alive, dead, lost, to follow up, and so on. And so the semantic -y people in this uh, projects that is there a generic semantic model that could represent all 16 of these common data elements? I might call them CDEs for abbreviation. So again, I turn to uh, Michel de Boncier, because he had invented and been using for quite some time the semantic science integrated ontology. Uh, and he has a model for representing observational data. And it looks basically like this, I'll go very quickly. Identifier denotes a particular role, and identity plays that role. That role is realized in some process. That process has an output. That output refers to a quality of the entity. Right? So for example, a blood test measuring process gives you a blood test quality. So what does this look like uh, in the model? So date of birth, sex, I'm going to look at just sex in this case. This is what the model looks like, but don't worry about it. This is the bit that is important. Person has quality, a typed attribute of type NC, NCIT male, so the attribute of maleness. All of the rest of that are little holes where we could put metadata. So what was the protocol, who was the clinician who did it, what was the date, what was the device, which hospital, and so on. So as with all things fair, we focus a lot on metadata. Right? So for most measurements, and this, this is actually quite lovely, for most measurements, this entire model is exactly the same. The only thing we change is the ontological type of the process and the ontological type of the quality, which means that when I come <clears throat> to building queries, it's just the same pattern over and over and over again for every different attribute that I'm trying to query. So it makes building interfaces really quite straightforward. All right, so we, fair experts, built the model, but we can't touch the data, we can't even see the data. How do they get it in, right? So the legacy data is in some format, database, spreadsheet, CSV, we want to become fair without disrupting their day-to-day -day activities. 
Uh, again, we're not allowed to see the data or touch or move the data. Uh, instead, we're going to have to map it somehow from its existing format into FAIR. We're using two technologies that I won't go into detail called RML and YARML to create the mapping files. Those are both uh, invented at the University of Ghent. And we've decided to use CSV as a lingua franca for everyone because everybody can generate CSV. Right? No matter what your starting format is, uh, you can, and so we give you a template, we say, you fill that template, we do everything else. So this is actually the same as this, it's just the nodes are in a slightly different place, but this is what diagnosis looks like, and you'll see that there are some things that we have decided for you. This is an identifier, this is a disease or disorder. The actual identifier number you have to add, you have to add a comment, maybe. You have to add the actual uh, Orphanet disease code here, but the rest of the model is built for you. And so we give you a CSV template and we say, this, this, and this are the things you must give us. Everything else is optional metadata. Right? So what does the workflow look like? You decide what data you're going to publish. You pick the templates. You export your, your data into CSV following those templates. That's your job. After that, click, and everything else happens. <laughs> so, so we have what's called the fair in a box, which is the entire transformation pipeline plus the metadata publishing and the data publishing. Metadata publishing goes into a public repository. Data publishing goes into something behind your firewall. Uh, so that's fully automated, right? So the FAIR experts never have to see the data, they never have to touch it. You generate the CSV, you push a button, and it's published. Right, so we never touch the sensitive data. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I just want to note, because I'm going to show a lot of these, this is what we call a FAIR data point, this bipartite database with a public and a private facing uh, for metadata and data facing interfaces. All right, so does this actually work in practice? Now, I got a little bit ahead of the EJP project because I have a, a company uh, which also does verification. We were contracted by the EuroNMD organization uh, to do what they were doing in the EJP project. Uh, so over two months, we established this transformation pipeline for five independent registries in three countries. Every site is responsible for generating their own compliant CSVs. The RML and YARML is shared by everyone. It's public. It's in a GitHub. And the transformation happens independently at the will of the data provider, the data owner. They click the button whenever they want. So these are what the five fair data points look like. I'm getting enthusiastic. I'm hitting my machine. All right, so I'm going to say, right, so, so what? So what? So I'm now going to talk about privacy-preserving federated query, and this is interesting because we want to leverage that data using agents. Right? So now that these sites have gone through this process of doing their transformation into FAIR, both metadata and data, can we prove, sorry, I'm hot, can we prove that the world is a better place? And I just have to introduce you to Charlotte, Shalot is an adaptation of a former technology called Garlic, but I've stripped out most of the code of Garlic to make it safe to run in protected environments. Uh, so this is a very, very thin little interface that connects the outside world with a, a query, which can run over fair data. So that's all Shalot is, is a public-facing web address that points to a query. And what we do is we deploy that in a Docker image and then we have a public. This is really interesting. I'm going to take a little bit of time about how we did this. Right, so we have a public repository of queries. Those queries have gone through a governance process that we set up with the Euro NMD. Patient representatives, fair experts, clinical experts, privacy experts. All of us checking these queries, making sure that they actually answer the question we think they are, that they're not exposing personal information they could not be merged with other information in order to expose personal information. They're asking a clinically relevant question, and the patients are comfortable with their data being used in this way. 
All of that has to happen before they get published here. Once they're published here, Shalott will suck them in. Right, so whoop and whoop. And those two, <laughs> that's okay. As long as you can see one, that's fine. So these two participating sites are now sharing queries. So we're sending the queries into the protected environment. The queries have been vetted. Everyone's happy. And now I hit that interface, and I pull the data out, and I integrate it. Right. So we ask a question, for example, which registries contain records of proximal spinal muscular atrophy? That's the Orphanet code 70. And here's the shallot, 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 shallot for all these five. And then I integrate the results, and I get patient counts. So only two of the registries have that disorder. Right. So good proof of concept, but not very useful. Can we do some useful research? Well, the EuroNMD has just published, and I got permission to, to do this, so I'm not getting ahead of myself. Uh, they have a set of key performance indicators for neuromuscular disease treatments, uh, and they've published this as a PDF. Uh, and one of those is time from onset to specific diagnosis. And it turns out that in the CDEs, we have enough information to answer that question. And all of the sites should have that information because they all have to follow the CDEs. So I invented a Charlotte query. We deployed it. Well, we went to, actually, we went through several rounds of revision. This governance process works. We went through several rounds of division where the privacy experts said, could you please um, anonymize a little bit more? And it's like, yeah, sure. So we went through several rounds. But in the end, here is the results over uh, my favorite Duchesne parent project and uh, the Euro NMD using mock data at this point. But it's solved. Right? And this, I don't want to wow you with this, but this, this is not a trivial query to be distributed over independently acting sites, right? That's not a trivial accomplishment, right? So, success, right? No, no, no. Remember, we're, we're, working, we're trying to build for agents. Agents. Agents need metadata, right? So, my agent right now is pretty dumb. I have to actually tell it, here's the address of the KPI Charlotte service for DPP, and here's the address of the KPI Charlotte service for, uh, for Euro NMD, and that's really dumb, right? <laughs> My agent knows nothing. It only knows how to go to a website. <laughs> right. So let's follow the FAIR principles, right? Globally unique identifiers, metadata using FAIR vocabularies, and plurality of accurate and relevant attributes, that principle that forces you to do the work, right? This forces you to do the work. If you want to be fair, you have to make yourself fair. So, the obligation was, take all of these KPIs and turn them into an ontology or a controlled vocabulary. So now we have 80, because there were 80 KPIs, we have 80 subclasses of EDAM calculation, all published in OWL, in a public repository. And so what I do now is I go, so here's a fair data point, and just to point out that this is the, the public-facing portion of the fair data point. This is what it looks like. Here are the metadata records for three of the many Charlotte services I have. Every one has its own metadata record. What I do now is I add the new KPI term as the type of that interface. And I do the same for the others, because my agent has to be able to know which one to call. And now my agent is pretty smart. I don't have to know anything. I say, discover and access and integrate all of the time to diagnosis KPIs over all of the, all of the fair data points that you know about. And my agent goes off and does it. Right? It does a search for KPI, and it does a search for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it comes back, and it can integrate. So now I don't have to know anything. I send my agent out. It, it can go to an index, so just one thing I haven't told you, is that all of the FAIR data points in the world are indexed in a central location. There's a central repository that they ping on a, on a weekly basis, so you know that they're alive. So we go there, we say, show me all the FAIR data points. I go to each one of them, I execute that query, and I get my result. So, 
solved over multiple independently verified registries using now a smart agent. So the agents are saved, right? <laughs> right? Did you detect the cheat? I know some of you did. Some of you are going to say, well, of course that worked. Of course it worked, because we enforced the schema. <laughs> you could have done that with any old database. <laughs> That's true. It's true. Right? We enforce the schema. So in, in addition to being fair and r using rich semantic annotations and whatnot, we also enforce the schema. And that's really serious. Right? So this paper that my, my senior PhD student published, Pablo, uh, we and the CPASS team in the US derived independent schema for exactly the same data types. And we then manually even mapped them into BioLink to try and help the agent know <laughs> <laughs> which of the nodes were equivalent, and we got almost no interoperability. Interoperability dropped to almost zero. So this paper, although we say emergent, <laughs> that's really lipstick on a pig. <laughs> it was barely emergent. So we don't really achieve interoperability without both semantics and schema. Right? So is Aura right? Has the semantic web failed for agents? Well, maybe, maybe not. Right. So FAIR requires you to be transparent. We created a rich model. We created vocabularies and whatnot. And there wasn't actually a, a true peer equivalent at the time. So the question really is, is using that model to achieve interoperability really cheating? And I don't think so because of the salvation of R1.3, <laughs> that metadata meets domain-relevant community standards. There was no standard, so we invented it. And now we've encouraged other people to, to adopt it. Right? And we can map from one to the other and so on. But I don't think it's cheating entirely. But it certainly doesn't work without, which is notable. Right? All right, vignette number four, access control. So in this case, I really am cheating. Right. So these key performance indicators are all aggregating services. There's no personal data exposed. It's, it's a percentage that comes out, or, or a number, or a time. Right. So there's no personal information exposed, so there's actually no need for access control. And again, we have a governance, or, uh, governance process that confirms that we can make these completely public. Right. These have all been vetted. So there's no need for access control. But that's not true in most situations. Right? You're going to have uh, consent. You're going to have usage restrictions. And we get back to this issue of the license. Like, oh, license. But we have to be transparent about it. Right? So normally, at this point, I would talk about patient consent. But you're not all medical people. So let's get away from the human taxon. Let's go to a different kingdom. So I'm going to talk to you about a project that was funded about eight months ago uh, for linking uh, ex situ plant germplasm resources. So let me just tell you a little bit about the germplasm bank that we work with. Many of the slides are going to be in Spanish. I, I apologize. <clears throat> so uh, the germplasm bank is a seed bank, an, an in vitro conservation unit, and a field collections unit for wild species. Uh, it's one of the most complete collections of wild crucifers in the world with 1,027 taxa, 4,800 accessions of those taxa, special emphasis on the Brassicaceae, uh, and currently preserves 24% of the threatened flora in Spain. So that's the, that's the thing that we're representing. So the objective, when I talk to my student who's working on this, is just do what we did with EJP, because there's nothing medical about what we did with EJP. We just built a model and fill it with CSV. So do the same thing again. But this is tricky. In this case, we're not actually talking about data. We're talking about physical samples. Sorry, I'm really hot. So turns out that the regulatory environment for physical samples for germplasm for seeds is extraordinarily complicated. There are multiple international treaties. There are governmental treaties at the, at the national level. There are agreements uh, between biobanks, uh, between seed banks, and there are agreements, and there are rules at the university level as well. 
So there's multiple, multiple layers, and it's dynamic. So people are signing on to these treaties, so you have to keep track of who's signed on and who isn't. And it's not always the same, so you'll see that this treaty, which is the International Treaty on Genetic Food for Bula, Resources for Food and Agriculture, does not have the same membership as the Nagoya Protocol. Right, so here you have Canada and the US, yes, and here you have Canada and the US, no. Right. And there's a benefit-sharing requirement. Um, so if you take, for example, seeds from a third-world country and you use them for uh, development of a treatment or a, a drug, you must enter into an, a benefit-sharing agreement, and this is enforced by an international body. Right? So the regulatory environment is intense. So let's look at how bad it is. So this is for seeds from Diplotaxis. This is a Diplotaxis plant. So this is, this is the map of, of how you make the decision. Starting here, are you using it for taxonomic research? I won't go through the Spanish, but this is the path you follow, and then you get to here, because taxonomic research is actually one of these set-aside categories that is considered safe. Are you using it to improve resilience and also as a university researcher? Well, now the pathway is here. And non-agricultural purposes, if you're seeking a treatment for cancer and the plant is not on the International Treaty of Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture list, then you follow this path. And you can see that these paths can be, <laughs> can be pretty complicated. Right. <clears throat> and right now it's all done manually. It's all done by manually. And so now my agent is, once again, very dumb. It has no idea whether you are allowed to even know that the seed exists. Some of them are extremely sensitive, that the, the seed banks don't even publish the existence, they don't publish the fact that they have it, because it's so sensitive. Right. So we're in the early days, uh, but this is what we're exploring right now. Uh, is, it's called the ODRL, the um, ontology, uh, something digital rights language, I've forgotten the O now, ODRL, information model, um, and it's a, it's a way of representing for a machine uh, policies. So policies have rules, actions, parties, constraints, and they're all around particular assets, whether that be physical or, or digital. So what we're doing now is we're building fair metadata that describes the treaties and the norms. We're trying to make logical pathways between the ODRL open digital rights language, ODRL uh, policies to make sure that they get into the correct logical de decision order. And this is an invitation uh, if you want to participate uh, and if you can bring expertise. So right, right now, we're at the point where we need to build code. Right. We, we don't need observers right now, we need coders. Uh, so I'm assembling a group of engineers to jointly work on this. We, we have five or six people now in multiple countries working on this. Okay, so invitation, if you want to, if you want to play, it's a lot of fun. It's really hard. All right, now on to vignette number five. How are we doing? Oh, we're good, we're good. Evaluating fairness. Uh, so, completely different topic. Uh, the co-authors of, of this work are written here. So, I contend, and not everyone agrees, but I contend that fairness is measurable by definition. Right? So, because of what I said in that paragraph, that we're trying to create a web of data that can be intelligently re reused by machines, because that's the goal, that necessitates behaviors of data providers. You can't get around it. And the behaviors have to be concretely described because they have to be coded. Right? And so we can write software that correctly reuses the data, and if we can write software that reuses the data, we can also write software that examines whether data can be reused, and that means we can test things. Like it or not, you can test things. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about creating the FAIR Evaluator, which is the, the first fully automated agent for testing fairness. Um, and of course, being a FAIR person, my first objective was to focus on metadata gathering. So I, I went out into the, into the world 
and I tried to figure out how people were doing it right now. What were the mechanisms for metadata publication that people were following? And I tried to build an exhaustive harvesting library and a workflow, uh, and that is, it pursues paths that I actually don't think are really fair in spirit, but this is what the community is doing. Don't be prescriptive, be generous as you possibly can. Um, just as an aside, the consequence of that is that my system is really slow. <laughs> really slow, because it tries every possible thing, it gives you every opportunity to do the right thing. Right. And then we have tests, and so this is what one of the tests looks like, and so this is, again, my, my favorite of the principles, the identifier in the data. And so when I gather all of this metadata up, some of it comes in as linked data, so RDF, some of it comes in as uh, JSON, some of it comes in as, as uh, XML, not so much anymore. But. And so what I do is I, I look in the non-linked data for a variety of different tags uh, that could be an indication that you are trying to tell me that this is the identifier of the data. Right. And then also graph data. And again, I found every one of these in use in the real world. Right? I didn't make this up. <laughs> I found these. Right? And so it just checks now, can I find that? And if yes, you pass, and if no, you can't. So now we have tests for all of the principles and multiple variations of the principles. And then we have an overarching workflow engine Carol will love <laughs> an overarching workflow engine that says, all right, let's put a pathway of tests together and chug, 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 and then come out with a result at the end. So the evaluator allows the community, and this is actually quite distinct for the evaluator compared to all of the others, is that this is community-based, and the community is now registering their own, service, uh, their own tests into the evaluator, which is exciting. So... Maturity indicators designed by the community, published by the community completely independently of me. Uh, Community-specific collections, so I want to apply this, 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 and this test to my resource, and then execute. This is what the interface looks like. Uh, this is the address, w3id.org, am I fair? And this is what the output looks like. So here you have an overview of the number of tests you passed and failed. Here you have green lights and red lights for each of the tests that you passed or failed. Um, and inside of that, if you open up those, you get actually quite a lot of metadata about why you passed or why you failed. So it's being used. So we have about 10,000 evaluations using the public version. So this is people coming to my website and hitting the button. Uh, the private version from my company, we also have several thousand, probably more than 10,000 evaluations because you can queue them up hundreds of tests at a time and go home for the weekend. Uh, individual tests can be executed because every one of the tests is independent, but we don't monitor that. And we know that people are embedding individual tests into their own workflows. Right, so at some point in my workflow, I just do a quick check. Am I fair on this test? Yes, no, and continue. And so we don't track that at all. So I don't know uh, how often those are being used. But again, this is actually making the evaluator... That's annoying. That shows up for you too. Okay. <laughs> Let me just quickly try to log out of everything. Oh, it's not going to work. Okay. We'll just ignore it. Uh, so this, this actually makes the evaluator a little bit distinct in that our, our tests are independently executable. They're not embedded inside of the evaluation system itself. Okay, but fair assessment has become a cottage industry. I just love this picture because this is actually very close to where I grew up as a child. <clears throat> so we have now 22 independent fair assessment platforms, which tells us that the community of stakeholders actually wants a solution to this problem. Most of them are questionnaire-based. Some of them are automated. But unfortunately, the outputs can't be compared. Right, now, how bad could it be? So this is just two of them. One of them is, this is my commercial, the commercial version of my evaluator, and this is uh, the public version of Fuji on the same URI, which is, I, I showed you the Duchesne Fair Data Point. 
Fair data points were specifically designed to be as fair as possible, specifically designed to be fair. On my tests, 20 out of 22. On Fuji, 2 out of 24. <laughs> so clearly, we are not interpreting the principles the same way. Right? But it could be more than that, and we don't know because vignette number 5A. There's a problem with metadata discovery. And in fact, this led to the EOSC. The EOSC was looking at this evaluation problem because they want fair resources on the Open Science Cloud, and they want to be able to prove that they are fair, and they go to the evaluation systems and they contradict. Right? They wanted a solution, so they put together the Task Force on Fair Metrics and Data Quality, and I was co-chair uh, together with Chris and at some point in the past, Carlo uh, Lachanina. Um, and so this is based on the Fair Working Group recommendations, which said support the definition and implementation of evaluation tools, their thorough assessment, including inclusiveness, comparison of tools, identification of their biases, and applicability in different contexts. So our charter as a task force was to check the implementation of metrics vis-a-vis uh, -vis established quantitative criteria and those, the implementation within the various measurement tools. So I started putting together hackathons and workshops uh, where we brought together the creators of all of the assessment tools. Uh, so far, we've had four sessions. Next week, we're having another two sessions. Uh, we discussed the problems, why are there differences, and we decided that the first target was this metadata harvesting process, right? Um, because it's impossible to compare tests when you're testing different substrates. So now, the other part of that vignette, let's look at how confusing and, and um, ambiguous this process can be, even for something as regulated as a DOI. Right? So this is a little bit techy, so apologies. So we start with the DOI, and how do you get metadata for a DOI? Well, the first thing you do is you put an accept header specific for data site and say, I would like this kind of metadata, this format of metadata. You resolve the DOI, data site sees this header, and it intercepts the resolution process, and it, it sends you the metadata that data site knows about for that DOI. All right. So now you have metadata. Now you go back to the beginning. And you say, OK, now I'm not going to ask for anything special. I'm just going to let the DOI resolve. And so there may be multiple redirects, blah, 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 blah. But eventually, you end up here at the landing page, sometimes, of the, <clears throat> of the digital object. So this is, I'm going to call it a landing page. Right? If you look into that landing page, there's metadata embedded in the landing page. If you look at that metadata, one type of metadata that they give you is this called link. The type of relation is alternate. And then they give you a URL corresponding to that alternate. Now, if you look at the definition of alternate in the specification, alternate keyword is used with type. So alternate type, yep to indicate that the reference document is a reformulation of the current document in the specified format. Is frequent trigrams.csv a reformulation of the entire deposit? Nah, I don't think so, right? So, but it's ambiguous, right? We, people have, clearly have interpreted it that way. I did not. And so if you have the different evaluation systems making these kinds of different decisions and different interpretations, you don't even have the same substrate. So there's a lot of sources of ambiguity. My harvester has to guess what to do. The call for data site saying, I want this format, that's not advertised by data site. You have to know it. It has to be hard coded. It should be advertised, and it can be advertised, but it's not. Uh, there's partial overlap. <laughs> Not always identical. Partial overlap between data site source metadata and the metadata from Zenodo. Uh, there's ambiguity in these type links. 
uh, the interpretation of the landing page itself is ambiguous, right? So some DOIs actually resolve directly to data. The one in this example resolves to a landing page. So what does the DOI actually represent? Does it represent the data or does it represent the landing page? Because when you resolve it, you end up at a landing page sometimes. Sometimes you end up with the data. And so it's, it's a little bit ambiguous even what the DOI represents and whether that DOI should be the subject of the triples, the metadata triples, right? Most critically, there's no way to support provider source metadata. And that's the critical, critical stuff. And this is just one example. And, and it, it's one of the most widely recognized examples. But this is just one example. As I explored the world, <laughs> the Wild West, there's a lot of different pathways, which is why my evaluator is so slow. Right? Because I don't presume that anyone does anything correctly. So <laughs> here we have the output from the workshops and the hackathons, which we call fair signposting. Uh, if you want to see, uh, we've published it here, the DOI. <laughs> DOI is down here. Whoops, down here. Uh, we decided that there are three things necessary for successful traversal of a fair record. You need to unambiguously know the GUID, you need to unambiguously know the metadata records, and you need to unambiguously know the data. There's the workshop attendees. This is what it looks like. So it's actually using the same link. So I showed you the link lines. It's using the same thing, but now we tightly define what everything means. And in fact, the specification defines it. Cite as is a relationship with the globally unique identifier described by is a one-to-many relationship between the entity and all of the metadata records. And item points inwards to uh, data records inside of the deposit. The links can appear either in the web page or in the header of the message that is being sent to your machine. So it can be used both for web pages and for non-web page objects. Let's look at what the harvesting workflow looks like now. Starting point, completely irrelevant. I don't have to start with a DOI. I can start with a web search. I can start with a bookmark. I eventually end up here. And then I look inside of that, and I say, OK, I need to find the site as, I need to find the described by, and I need to find the items, please. Site as, OK, there's the official canonical identifier. Here is a link. In this case, it's going to data site, but it doesn't have to. It points to the metadata explicitly. And then a link individual items inside of the repository. So now the purpose of the landing page is unambiguous. It is a broker. Right? Better yet, I can point inwards at provider source metadata. So now when I deposit data into Zenodo, I can say, here is a big metadata file describing all of my data sets. You could never do that before. Right? So this is huge. Right? And Dr. Brogan, this is what you need for your taxi driver case. Right? <laughs> so we have a solution for you. All right. It works for non landing page objects. So I, again, a starting point doesn't matter, web search, whatever, I end up at a digital object, in this case, an image. I then go up into the headers of the web message, and I look for site as, I look for described by, in this case, the item is actually the image itself, so there's no item. But I can point outwards to the canonical URL, I can point outwards to the metadata file. So no matter where I end up in the space, I can unambiguously navigate everywhere else. Three links, that's all we needed. Right. And so I am claiming that this, this principle was written because we had no way of putting metadata into digital objects that had no spot for it. So the only way to find the metadata was to search based on the identifier of the object, actually do a web search to find the metadata record for that image. Right, you would identify, but only if the identifier was in the, was in the metadata. Now we don't need that, because it's, it's now explicit. Uh, and we're being extremely professional, so mostly thanks to Carol's group. We have a benchmark environment where we can test all of the evaluation systems over both positive and negative examples, make sure they are, in fact, all behaving exactly the same way. Any new evaluation system we will challenge in this environment. And this is the first step to harmonization. And again, <clears throat> we're going to have a hackathon next week. In the wild, 
Signposting has now been added to the 5.14 release of Dataverse. Um, we're having a meeting in October with the Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative of the NIH. So we're going to be presenting the idea to Zenodo's fig shares and so on. Hopefully get a lot more participation. Uh, it, is on, it is in production right now in the Fair Data Point reference implementation. So it is being adopted, which is good news. Perfect. Closing thoughts. What do I see in the future of FAIR? So my personal opinion is this. We have to keep going. So we have to keep going, but we have to keep going remembering that the idea is to be a path to improvement and reusability. Right? Fairness is not a goal. Reusability is the goal. Right? So fairness is a way that you communicate between you and some exploratory agent, or as Carol would say, Fairness is a contract. <laughs> I added that after your comment the other day. Right. We have to ensure that it is, in fact, achievable, that everybody knows how to do it. Signposting. Everybody knows how to do it. It's aspirational. It has transparent expectations. And we have to continue to catalog success stories like the EJP, I would say. I think we're doing a really good job providing examples that the community can follow. I also think that fair assessment is a quagmire, but it's necessary. It is just necessary, right? Funding agencies are not going to allow you to say, I'm fair because I say so. Right? So we're going to have to tolerate fair assessment. So we have to make sure that fair assessment is trustworthy, objective, consistent, non-judgmental, and provides actionable advice, not just a score, right? And that means that all the stakeholders have to agree on some form of governance over, uh, in particular, fair assessments, and again, the EOS Task Force on Fair Metrics and Data Quality has started a process of trying to build governance. We're going to try and get a model of governance at the next two hackathons next week. Uh, so we invite you to join us. The paper is here with links to the mailing list and so on. And finally, are agents really dead? Right. Well, I think agents failed because in the past, we didn't pay enough attention to metadata. And FAIR is correcting that. So in my world, agents live on. OK, so thanks for the invitation. Thanks to all of my colleagues and agencies and so on. And uh, yeah, I did it, Carol. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs>